Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Immigrants, they make up 37% of New York City's population. In 2014, there were more than 3 million immigrants, which would comprise the third largest city in the United States. With their sons and daughters, immigrants make up 55% of New Yorkers, the highest levels since 1910. 168 home languages are spoken in New York City's public schools, and most of those languages at CUNY. They account for 35% of New York City's economic output and make up 47% of employed New York City residents. New York City's demographic ballet has more and diverse participants who are dramatically changing the city as they themselves are changed. Increasingly and sometimes explosively, immigrants are also changing the choreography of Europe's demography. Strangers no more. Joining me to talk about contemporary immigrants in New York and in Europe is Professor Nancy Fona. Nancy is a distinguished professor of sociology at Hunter College and the CUNY Graduate Center, and she's one of the country's leading immigrant scholars. Nancy has authored or edited 18 books. The most recent are Strangers No More, Immigration and the Challenges of Integration in North America and Western Europe, written with Richard Alba, and New York and Amsterdam, Immigration and the New Urban Landscape. In 2013, she published a very highly regarded one out of three, Immigrant New York in the 21st Century, which is the latest of her very influential studies on immigration in New York. Nancy, welcome. Well, thank you. Great uh, this, to be here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, why is Tony Soprano quintessentially American. Well, he's a descendant of immigrants. So, I mean, that makes him quintessentially American in that most Americans, most New Yorkers are descendants of immigrants, if they're not immigrants themselves, because, I mean, New York, you just said, uh, you know, three million immigrants, you know, children of immigrants, that brings us up to about five million. And that's just New York. But there are 40 million immigrants in the nation as a whole. But let me say, the other aspect of Tony Soprano Go ahead. that I just have to say is that I think this also indicates the continued, in Tony Soprano's case, negative stereotypes yep. Yep. that still exist about many descendants of immigrants, and that's many generations later. So it shows us that you know we have to keep that in mind as well, yeah. and not just celebrate immigrants, which we do and is important to do, but to realize also some of the barriers that they face. Okay. One out of three, which is going to be the topic, main topic of today's conversation, is extremely interesting because of its views. It's both a macro top-down look as well as a micro bottom-up look. Let's, let's go to one of my favorite quotes from the book from a Chinese immigrant. New York offers many fortunes but unequal opportunities to newcomers. Not everyone can make it here. It, New York, is like a happy melting pot for some, a pressure cooker for many others, and still a dumpster for the unfortunate. And in a sense, that really captures the, the plight of immigrants in New York. How did you come to write this particular book after the several books that you've written about immigration in New York? Well, I think there's a need for an overview. I mean, I've written a lot about New York, immigrants to New York. I started out actually working on Jamaican immigrants in New York and then moved on to a broader picture. But there's no real big overview about immigrants today. And as you say, I mean, immigrants are such a key part of New York. Uh, you mean three million? I mean, we get. The, I keep saying the numbers, you know, but the numbers <laughs> say it all. Right. I mean, if you're talking about 37 percent of the population, if you're talking about with their children, 55 percent, this is New York. And so we, I think there's really a need for a volume, as you say, that gives a broad overview, which I tried to do in my introduction, but also has chapters on the individual groups so that people can better understand the experiences of the groups. 
Why do they come? I mean, we sort of know the story. And why New York? Why not someplace else, even though they do go elsewhere? But why is New York a special immigrant city? Well, that's a, you've asked about three questions. Yes, I one. know. But so yes, let, me start, let me start with one. Number one. Okay, why do they come? Because that's not just a question of New York. Why do they come? They come mostly for economic reasons, because they think they can do better here, because they can earn more money, because they can have a better standard of living. In some cases, people come thinking they're going to send the money home yep. to help and their relatives. Go. In many cases, people come and they think they're not going to stay very long. They're going to come, they're going to make some money, and they're going to go back. Whether they go back or not is a different question. Sure. There are political reasons why people come from many countries, that they're escaping war or persecution. Uh, one of the chapters in the book is about Liberians. Yep. And they clearly came because of this terrible, brutal civil war in Liberia and its aftermath. And so that was, they were refugees, many of them. Okay, right. so that's a reason why okay. some come. I haven't finished. Go. Okay. <laughs> Another is that once a migration begins, it has a kind of cumulative effect. Doug Massey calls it cumulative causation, um, that or chain migration is what people, you know, you've got relatives and friends sure. here, they send back the money, they are available here to provide housing and help you get a job. And cultural support. Yes, exactly, and so that tends to pull others in. And I think also we should also think that immigrants come not just for themselves but for their children and to give their children a better life. And they think their children will have a better life here, that their children will be, have more access to better education, including at CUNY, um, that they'll be able to move We up. see all and the immigrants in CUNY. Many, many immigrants say, you know, it's a big struggle for them to come here. In many cases, immigrants come and they take lower status jobs than they had in their home country. So in many ways, it's a downward move for some of them, even if they're making more money. Mm -hmm. You know, they experience prejudice here in many cases, but they say they're doing it for their children. And so that's why I think immigrants come to the U.S. Why New York in particular is the next question. Right. And they come to New York in particular often because they have friends and relatives here. So that draws them. They come to New York because there are jobs. I mean, I think if there were not jobs, they sure. wouldn't come. Sure. So they can find work. And they also feel comfortable here. Well, they, I feel that they, they, they think they can feel more comfortable here than perhaps in other cities. I would say that that's very strong for black immigrants mm -hmm. who are loath to go to places where there are few blacks because they that initially at least that would be, not be comfortable for mm -hmm. them. But I think New York is a fairly welcoming city for immigrants. There are large communities from their home country here, so they feel they can move into those, those communities. Yep. And so I think that's one of the reasons, you know, those are the reasons, among the reasons why people come to New York and not elsewhere. Okay. How do the immigrants and immigration today differ from yesterday? How do these immigrants differ from the Italians, the Jews, and the Irish before them, and then the blacks and Puerto Ricans? What's, what's different about the, yeah, the new immigrants? I know you've just traced out this amazing history of New York, right? Right. The Italians, I mean, the Irish and the Germans came in the mid-1800s. Right. The Jews and Italians from the late 1800s into the 1920s. Mid-20th century, it's Puerto Ricans and African Americans yep. from the South. Yep. And post-65, We've seen immigrants coming from all over the world. Okay, to explain I, 60, what, what happened in Well, 65. the Hart Seller Act basically eliminated the national origins quotas that had been, in, been put in place in the 1920s to restrict immigration. Yeah, the Johnson-Reed Act. Yes, right. it was put in place to restrict immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. Um, by establishing quotas for, or, that were based on earlier population uh, census figures. And so that was a key factor in basically really bringing the immigration from, of Jews and Italians to a halt. Also, there was the Great Depression and World War II. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese, the, the Asians, of course, have been excluded from the U.S. Yep. since 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act and subsequent renewals and expansion to other Asian groups. So Asians really were mm -hmm. excluded. The 1965 Act had a major effect for Asians and that it really opened up the possibility for them to come. It eliminated national origins quotas. Ironically, it actually made it more difficult for people from Latin America to come. Why? Be because it, it instituted quotas for the, for the first time, numerical quotas for the first time for immigrants from independent Latin American countries, which didn't have them before. Why? 
I don't know, but it did it. Okay. I mean, it, it was a kind of equal thing. And, and so um, that, that created a problem. Uh, uh, eventually, it created a problem right. for Mexicans. But if we're looking again at why, to come back to your question, you know, how is immigration today different from the, you know, the past? If we look just, say, at the last great wave of immigration to New York of Jews and Italians, well, and we looked at the other, first of all, they're coming from different places. Europeans are still coming to New York, but mostly immigrants are from Asia, Latin America, and Caribbean. Yep. I mean, present day, what is it, 28 percent, about 60 percent of the immigrants in New York are from Asia and Latin America. So that's a and big... And you look at the numbers, the Dominican Republic, one, China, two, right. Mexico, three, Jamaican, Guyanese, Haiti. They're from different places. Right. And they're more diverse. I mean, it's not just we, so we talk about, you know, Italians and Jews overwhelmingly dominating the immigration right. in the past. That was not, that's not true today. No one, two, or three groups is, is dominant that way. So that's a big change in terms of, well, another thing is that there were not really undocumented immigrants before. Right. If you were coming from Europe, the big thing was getting on the boat yep. and passing inspection. Once you got on the boat, you really, most people got through Ellis Island without any trouble. A very tiny, yep. tiny number were excluded there. So the big, th today, of course, you need a visa. You, to come and, and work here and live here legally. Mm -hmm. And there are, we know, in the nation as a whole, there are 11 million undocumented immigrants, but there are about half a million undocumented immigrants in New York. So that's something new also in terms of immigration today, in terms of who's come, in terms of the diversity of the immigrants, in terms of undocumented, in terms, another thing, on a more positive note, Go ahead. Um, immigrants today are much more highly educated. About little more than a quarter of the immigrants in New York have a college degree or more. Now, it's true the structure of the whole educational system has changed. You know, you need a college degree today to do things that you didn't need a college yep. degree in the past. That said, we're still getting a, a high percent, relatively high percent of, of well-educated immigrants. And in the past, that, we, that was not as true. Okay, so that's, that's another difference. And, of course... That's the difference in the flows, but of course New York is very different <laughs> too than the, than the new New York that Italians and Jews were entering a hundred years ago. In fact, you know we've had a civil rights movement, <laughs> civil rights legislation, ethnic diversity is celebrated in New York. In fact, that's one of it wasn't celebrated in New York a hundred years ago. That that would that, that's fa that was fascinating both in this book, <laughs> Strangers No More, that. There's a real different attitude that we, diversity is a plus. Especially and, in New York. And in the past, there was a much more xenophobic aura about immigration. Well, there's still a lot of nativism. Of Let's course. Not, and there's still prejudice. Of However, course. But in New York, in particular, there's this, you know, mayors say how much they love immigrants. There are parades for every group up Fifth Avenue. Um, there are, you know, the alternate side parking rules for Diwali and the Muslim holidays. Mayor you know, de Blasio, we now have two Muslim holidays in the schools. I mean, that would be unheard of. A hundred years ago, you couldn't speak Yiddish in the playgrounds in New York. So, I mean, ethnic diversity was hardly celebrated. And in fact, I think that's one reason that the children of immigrants, you know, divorced, tried to divorce themselves from their parents' ethnic cultures. And today, you don't have that. I mean, the children of immigrants, let me say, are becoming American and New Yorkers, but they're proud of their parents' ethnic heritage and, and roots in a way that, because it's changed, there's a change in New York. And, and you, you quote a, a speech by Theodore Roosevelt in uh, 1915 saying that you can't be a hyphenated American and be an American. Now the, it's almost the exact opposite, that Almost everybody considers themselves, in one sense or another, a hyphenated. I think that's really important in the United States, actually, New York and the United States, that it's not just immigrants who consider themselves hyphenated Americans, but it's Italian Americans, right, Irish Americans. So it's not something that makes immigrants or the immigrants' children stand out. It's kind of the American way. And it's become the American way. It wasn't that way. <laughs> it wasn't that way 100 years ago. Okay. You, in, in one out of three, and also in the other mm -hmm. books, talk about the impacts of immigrants on New York and New York on immigrants, because mm -hmm. it's, it goes both ways. And you talk about the effects on neighborhoods and communities, 
cuisine and popular culture, oh, which yes. is my absolute yes. favorite, ethnic division of labor and mainstream institutions. Talk about at least the first two, neighborhoods and communities and cuisines and popular culture. Okay, well, neighborhoods, we know, and, and neighborhoods have ch keep changing. I mean, that's, I think, the interesting thing about neighborhoods. I mean, we think of Washington Heights as a Dominican neighborhood, and it is a Dominican right. neighborhood, but there are more Dominicans living in the Bronx now yep. than live in Washington yep. Heights. And there are a lot of other folks living in Heights in one. Yes, well, that's another thing we can talk about, not related so much to immigrants, but to gentrification. Absolutely. But at the same time, we think of Chinatown, you know, Sunset Park, and Flushing. Flushing. But Bensonhurst. Right. I mean, the Chinese have moved to different, well, there are a lot of Chinese, we can talk about that, their numbers right. have really grown. But they're moving to other neighborhoods. Yep. There are new, like, one of the chapters in the book, I keep saying, Little Liberia on the North Shore sure. of Long Island. There are little Mexicos all over the city now. So you that have a there little are, Bombay, you yes. have little Korea, you have little everything. Well, and so these are changes. As, as, as groups come in, their numbers rise, they look to new communities. The, the, the housing becomes difficult in some areas. They look for housing elsewhere. So there's a shift. So ethnic neighborhoods have changed in New York. And it, um, I think that's that's one of the changes, okay, that we keep seeing the shift, yeah, with neighborhoods. Okay, the, uh, continuing neighborhoods mm -hmm. before we get to mm -hmm. cuisine and popular culture, you have neighborhoods where in the old country mm -hmm. they're killing one another and in Richmond Hill they're not. Yeah, and there yeah. is, there's something else going on here. Mm -hmm. Well, when you come to New York, people change. <laughs> and people, well, first of all, they may bond over national origin. And, and so religious differences may become less. Yep. Yeah, cultural differences, like eating the same food, going to the same restaurant, yep. you know, shops, um, may become more important in, some, in many ways. Not always, but in many ways than these religious divisions, for example, that divide, that divide them in the home country. And they become less relevant here. Yeah, I Because they're think not so. relevant politically. I mean, a lot of times those divisions are riled up by politicians yep. seeking support. Yep. That's not happening here. They're being, not being appealed to that way. They're being appealed to on ethnic grounds. Right. And also, no group is large enough to dominate because there are so many. So you have a much more coalitional policy politics than you had, yes. well, the three eyes, you know, the Irish, the Italians, and those from right. Israel, right, if you right. will. Especially at the city level. Right, and because now it's from Albanians mm -hmm. to Zambians. Yes. Right. And all of them have, as you indicated earlier, they all have a place in which their, their, their co-country folks are. So there's 5,000 of everything in New York. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. There are a lot of people from a lot of different places. Yes, who are who are there? Yes, I think that's true. And coalition politics—that's the the name of the game now, right? Okay, talk about immigrants in the economy. Mm -hmm. How important they are. Tom DiNapoli did a report, mm -hmm. I guess, in two thousand, the late two thousand thirteen, mm -hmm. on the role of immigrants in the New York City economy, and it's astounding. I mean, forty-seven percent of the labor force is. It's immigrant. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. Talk about the sort of the the, the economic or macroeconomic changes that well, are going David on. Well, David Halleck talks about it, that in the They're chapter. In, the piece. in yes. one out of three. I mean, clearly, immigrants. Well, a lot of the immigrants are young adults <laughs> of working age. That's sure. They come here. Sure. So in the workforce, we know that immigrants are working. They have very high labor force participation rates. I mean, partly that's because they come here to work. Right. But also it's because a lot of them aren't even eligible for benefits if they don't work. <laughs> so that this, they have no choice. Right. So they're working. And they which are, is different than Europe, which we'll get to in a yeah, moment. Which, Go yeah. ahead. So they're working. And they're working. They're reviving. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're bringing purchasing power to the city. I mean, they buy goods and services and use good services, and so they also are setting up businesses, mm -hmm. a large number of businesses. I mean, a, the major, a large number of businesses of New York are immigrant-owned. Right. So that's also, you know, good for the economy. They're, so they're, they're setting up businesses, they're employing each other, they're, they're using goods and services, and therefore stimulating the economy. So they're good for New York, particularly since, you know, if you look at the demographic picture, it does come down again. You know, we see this large number of immigrants coming in, but all people are moving out at right. the same time. Right, there's churn. There's churn all the time. And so, and, and because immigrants are hardworking, I mean, that's a, a stereotype, I know, but many of them are because they've come here right. for that reason. I mean, that's why they're here, to work hard, to do well for their children, to send money home. That's really motivating them. And also, migration is selective, you know, that we get, we get the best and the brightest in many ways, those who have ambition, those who, who move. It's a big it's, it's, 
Which is sort of the pattern of the past as well. Okay. What's next for immigrants and immigration to New York? I mean, you're talking about an increase in domestic migrant. What, what, mm. what do you say? Well, I think we're seeing one thing that, that the demographers at the city planning, uh, you know, Joe Salvo, and, uh, uh, at, he predicts is the growth of Chinese immigration and that pretty soon the Chinese will be the number one group. Right. That will be a big change, okay, because Dominicans have held that place <laughs> for a long time. Right. Now, we're talking about foreign-born. We're right. not talking about people of Dominican ancestry. Yep. So we're talking about immigrants. So, I mean, that will be a big change. By the way, that's a change nationally, too. There was a report that was just issued a f about a week ago, which indicated that in two thir 2013 in the nation, for the first time in a long time, Mexicans did not, or were not the number one group coming in in that year. Wow. Yeah. And it was from? It was Chinese and Indians. Where more Chinese and Indians were coming into the U.S. just in 2013. Uh -huh in other words, as legal immigrants, yep. than uh, Mexicans. Okay. I, so, I, but, so the Chinese in New York and, the Chi and Indians will probably grow. Mexicans will grow. But certainly the population of Mexican ancestry will grow. Mm -hmm. Their numbers are growing. Africans coming in in more numbers. Yep. Um, I think we'll continue to see immigration to New York. I mean, that's the other sure. story. Sure, sure. Okay. Strangers no more. I, very interesting. I mean, I, I literally just read it. It's really the first look at immigrant assimilation in a really comparative perspective. And you look at six Atlanta countries, the United States, Canada, England, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Similarities and differences to the U.S. I mean, what what did you learn researching and writing this book? Well, I think I mean there are a lot of messages. Go in this ahead, book give me because a... it's it's a complicated, enormous. Wow, comparison. it is. According in looking at different what we call different domains, we look at residential segregation, we look at education, we look at race, religion, we look at. Uh, a, a, a very institutional politics. Yes, the ability to elect co-ethnics to office. So it's very broad. I guess you know, in some ways you could say there's no country, you, there's no winner, there's no loser. There's in no, terms of the success and, in and integrating folks? Yeah, I mean, there's no country that looks, you know, consistently better across all the domains, and there's no country that looks consistently worse. So if you look at the U.S., uh, for example, the U.S. looks good when it comes to employment. We just talked sure. about the high levels of labor force participation yep. among immigrants, partly, as I said, because they don't have much choice. Right, because okay. there's no social network. there's network, no social welfare state, right. as there is in these European yep. countries. Yep. Um, uh, they look, the U.S. looks good, and we can talk more about when it comes to religion. Our religion is a way of integrating immigrants in the U.S., let me just say. But the U.S. does not look good when it comes, for example, to residential segregation. It doesn't look Which is good, essentially race. Which is essentially a race story. Canada looks quite good. But Canada's story is different because Canada has very selective yeah. immigration wow. policies. Yes, it has very so that its immigrant immigrant population is a very highly educated yep. one, and yep. so you would expect that they would be doing better. Also, they have multicultural policies. It is true, but the selection of uh, their immigration selection policies are, are critical. And they keep out what you you and, and Richard call low-status well, immigrants, like is, the Mexicans in the United States. Don't go to States. Canada. Right. So, in fact, our book focuses on low-status immigrants, right. those who will have the most trouble integrating. <laughs> Mexicans a lot. We focus a lot on Mexicans yep. in the U.S. Yep. Because uh, they're such a big group. Remember, and I should emphasize here in the U.S. as a whole, Mexicans are about 29 percent of the population, I mean, immigrant population. Yes, and and not so many. In, I mean, I, I didn't go. get to. I didn't get just to come back to New York just go. to make a point. I mean, N Mexicans are 29 percent of the of the popul immigrant population in the U.S., but they're 6 percent of the immigration population in New York, and that makes New York very different from other cities. Like L.A., like, for example. Like L.A., Houston, yep. Chicago, where the 40 to 50 percent of the immigrants are Mexican. That's not true in New York. Okay. The, the, the key variables, at least mm -hmm. that, that I've been able to pull out on, on only one reading in, in this, mm -hmm. is the importance of religion and race, particularly religion in Europe and race in the United States. Talk about why religion's more significant in Western Europe than here, and particularly uh, why Islam seems to be a greater barrier in Europe than it is here. I mean, Islam is a major barrier 
to integration and a major barrier for immigrant inclusion in Europe. I mean, first of all, I mean, there are a number of, there's tremendous hostility toward Muslims in Europe. Um, there is, you know, right-wing parties and even center-right parties mm -hmm. are making much of this in their, in their uh, attempt to garner support. Um, there is a terrible fear among many in Europe that Muslims and Islam is undermining basic European liberal values, that this is a threat to Europe as they know it. Um, so the, in the U.S., yes, there's anti-Muslim hostility. There have you know, been surveillance of Muslims, but there is nothing like the kind of hostility that you find in Europe. The other thing, of course, in Europe is that they've had homegrown Muslim terrorists. Right. The Charlie Hebdo murders, yep. the bombings in the underground. There are many thousands of um, young second-generation Muslims have gone off to Iraq and Syria to fight in the war. So there's a great concern in Europe and a lot of hostility towards Islam. Now, why do we not find that to that kind of degree? Or that immigrant issues have not been, to, as one person puts it, Islamified the way they have been in Europe. Well, one is the demographics, and this is something that we talk about in the book, that in Europe, about 40% of the non-EU immigrants in Europe are Muslim. Wow. In the U.S., 75% of the immigrants are Christian. Uh -huh. Less than f about 5% of the immigrants in the U.S. are Muslim. So, so it's they a much sort of match the demographic it's and much culture. Smaller. Okay. Also, um, Muslim migration to the U.S. is much more selective. So actually, Muslims in the U.S. are often middle class and have good incomes. In Europe, Muslims are uh, many Muslims are you know they're associated with unemployment, right. poverty, yep. lack, you know low yep. levels of education. And Turks, for example, are sort of the Mexicans of Europe in terms of their low status. Well, and, and Turks in Germany, in particular, where there are you know Moroccans in, in in the Netherlands, North Africans in France, in Europe and Britain, it's South Asians, it's Pakistanis and Bangladesh. Those are the very stigmatized groups. Okay, so one is demographics. Get back to why. Why the, it's, uh, Islam is so much more of a barrier in Europe than it, in much of Europe than it is in the U.S. The second has to do with the fact that the U.S. is a much more religious country than secular. And more Europe. tolerant, therefore. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, all the surveys show, you know, more Americans, they, many of you in the majority actually go to church. They, 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 they That's not regularly. true in Western no, Europe. No, it's very secular. Yep. After yep. centuries of domination by, by the church. church, or church they, they have freed themselves and they are very often, it's very aggressively secular. And so that's not true. I think it makes it more difficult, especially when Muslims make claims based on their religion. Okay. Third, I have to do the okay, third. Okay, do the to, third. I have to because do the third. We're, we're, we're over time already, but go ahead. Okay, the you third. You were having too much fun. Go oh, ahead. Oh, the third, very briefly, is these institutional links between the state and religion in Europe, which we don't have in the U.S. I mean, for example, in Europe, despite their secular values, um, the state, um, uh, you have in France, the state owns and, and maintains most, most churches, yep. but Muslims have to have, you know, their mosques are in basements and garages and right. makeshift sh structures. And I could go on about different aspects. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to stop now and you're going to come back and we're going to talk about second generations of sons and daughters of immigrants because that's the key both mm -hmm. in the United States and Europe. My thanks to Nancy Fona for making us more aware of the issues of immigration in our own country and across the world. See you next week when my guest is Thomas DiNapoli, New York State Controller, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.